on the one hand, we don't want to play into uh, reproducing uh, ugly stereotypes about Muslims that would justify discriminating against them. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia does not um, uh, deserve an immunity. But recently, the academia has succeeded, I think, coming back with some fresh paradigms and ideas which uh, will feed activism, I think, in the future. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is on over 30 stations from Vermont to New York City and beyond. Our YouTube channel is Struggle Video Media, and you can see our shows at thestruggle.org. We start the program by returning to the Saudi summit in DC to hear Raed Jarrar, who is the government relations manager for the American Friends Service Committee. And he's talking about how we can get our criticism of the Saudi government right on target and prevent Muslim haters from benefiting from things that we say. Then as Obama goes to visit King Salman, his best bud, we talk about upcoming protests of the Saudi-US war on Yemen that are coming to Connecticut and Rhode Island. The bulk of our show was recorded at Yale University. Today we broadcast the first part of a talk by Israeli professor Ilan Pape, who thinks that when we talk about Israel and reject the hapless two states for two people model, we best understand the situation by seeing Israel as a colonial settler state. First, back to D.C. for the Code Pink Saudi Summit and Red Gerar. I work with the American Friends Service Committee. It's a Quaker organization that has been uh, operational in the Middle East since the 1940s. Um, and as uh, Phyllis mentioned, I am from the Middle East originally. I'm half Iraqi and half Palestinian. I grew up um, in Jordan and Iraq and, and in Saudi Arabia as well. I uh, lived in Saudi Arabia uh, as a child. Um, and I have family living in, in Saudi Arabia and, and in Iran and in uh, other parts of the Middle East. Um, so I had like first-hand experiences there and <coughs> I was very critical of um, the Saudi government before it became fashionable to be critical of them. <laughs> um, I will talk a little bit about uh, AFSC's work regarding U.S. relationships from a regional perspective. Saudi Arabia is not, uh, does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in a, in a troubled region that the U.S. has a very long history uh, of um, intervention there. Uh, so the U.S. role in the Middle East at large has been a part of the problem historically. And that is uh, whether the U.S. Uh, supported oppressive regimes uh, or whether the U.S. Uh, interfered indirectly by giving and selling weapons uh, to those regimes or whether the U.S. interfered directly in the region. Uh, usually we, we have been uh, one of the forces of destabilization uh, and death and destruction in the Middle East. Uh, and I think uh, the image of the United States in the, in the Middle East was negative historically because of its alliance with dictators <laughs> and the Israeli occupation, but it deteriorated even more since 2003. Now, when it comes to uh, U.S.-Saudi relationships, uh, when I think about it, I always think about it within that context of a regional policy. So the same way that AFSC and myself have been promoting a regional-wide um, arms embargo, uh, we have been calling on the Obama administration to cut its arms sales to Saudi Arabia. N not because we hate Saudi Arabia in, in particular, because they are Saudis, but because of their actions. And there is existing U.S. law that prohibits the U.S. from selling weapons to countries that would use these weapons for violations of human rights. 
there are other laws that would prohibit the U.S. from giving military aid to countries that uh, violate human rights. And we've been promoting both. You know, when we talk about Israel or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or other human rights abusers in the region, the U.S. has this responsibility to deal with our role. You know, so we're not talking about issues of improving governance in Saudi Arabia. It's true, there is oppression and there is uh, there are issues with women and minorities and LGBT communities almost in every country in the Middle East. And the U.S. maybe somehow can play a positive role, you know. We usually say that we would, we never do. Uh, but maybe we can play a role in supporting democracy and human rights in some of these countries. And I, I am interested in that. But what I'm more interested in is that we should stop being accomplices and supporters to crimes committed in the region. So when, when, a, when a Palestinian kid is, is killed uh, in, in the West Bank, that, that is bad. And it's bad for so many different reasons. It's bad because it's an occupation. It's bad because he's a child. It's bad because it's a bad policy. But it's also bad because we paid for that bullet. And, and that is a different angle. And with Saudi Arabia, it's the same. You know, the, There are issues in Saudi Arabia that happen that, you know, if you look, read them from in the newspaper, they are bad, and I am critical of them. Uh, but there are issues that are bad, and we are paying for them, or we are making it happen. And I think that is an important angle to keep in mind while discussing U.S.-Saudi uh, relationships. Uh, the U.S. is definitely one of the more, uh, one of the larger sponsors of the Saudi government, uh, whether that is by giving the Saudi government political legitimacy or selling them weapons. Um, but uh, I mean, overall, there has been more tension between US, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in the last few years, mostly because of Syria. Uh, I don't think the Obama administration has followed the, um, the wishes of the Saudi government exactly. Yeah. And so there is, there is some tension there uh, uh, that, that is growing. It's, it's not necessarily bad, and I think uh, it's a tension that should continue to happen. Uh, and it creates a good moment for us to rethink the U.S. role in the region as a whole. <coughs> of course, the other part of the, of the tension was the U.S. Uh, improvement of relationships with Iran, which Saudi Arabia did not like. So I want to say two things that we should consider while we are um, working on rethinking these relationships between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. These are things in context that we have to consider. First thing is Islamophobia. And that is a very unfortunate context that we are operating out of here in the U.S. I don't know if you've been following the uh, presidential debates. <laughs> are we still referring to those as debates? <laughs> well, whatever circus is going there, um, it's, uh, I think the rhetoric, the anti-Muslim rhetoric there, um, which many of our organizations and many of us individually have been involved in uh, fighting against, that is, unfortunately, that overlaps with some of these Islamophobes using Saudi Arabia as a probe, as an example of how horrible Muslims are. So it's, it's a slippery slope. It's a, it's a more complicated situation when we talk about U.S.-Saudi Arabia re relationships. How can we deal with that within the, re you know, the real political context here in, in D.C. and in the U.S.? On the one hand, we don't want to play into uh, reproducing uh, ugly stereotypes about Muslims that would justify discriminating against them. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia does not um, uh, deserve an immunity because there are some uh, racists who hate Muslims. So how can we balance these two issues? And that's a very big question for us, I think, as progressive organizations. How can we balance our criticism to Saudi Arabia uh, and think about it in context so that we will not be reproducing anti-Muslim rhetoric. But at the same time, don't be gagged by our political correctness. And I know many people who are not willing to criticize U.S.-Saudi Arabia relationships because they think that would cont contribute to Islamophobia. I don't think that's a good position to take. We can do both. So that's... 
So I, th I think Islamophobia and, and foreign policy, in particular with Saudi Arabia, is something to keep in consideration. The other point that I want to keep in mind, and I touched on very quickly, is the fact that the entire region is up in flames. And there are multi-party wars and conflicts going on in the region. Saudi Arabia is one of the drivers for these conflicts. And so is Iran, and so is other uh, regional players, Turkey. So, and that is a personal observation that I have shared with, with many of my uh, friends and colleagues, that I noticed that in the last few months, uh, we in the left and the anti-war movement ha are more vocal in opposing US wars than opposing Russian and Iranian interventions. <laughs> and that is a problem. It's a problem because I think we, uh, uh, we have to oppose our own government's interventions and we have a uh, special moral obligation and legal obligation to oppose our own government's actions. You know, we can't equate Russian crimes with our government's crimes because we're not paying for Russian crimes. And we did not vote for Russian uh, leaders to lead that country. But we technically voted for our leaders. Uh, <laughs> technically. <laughs> says the Iraqi Palestinian. So so I'm saying like the, the keep, keeping that in context is extremely important because the the you know the fact of the matter is that Iran's role in Syria is as destructive if not more destructive than than Saudi Arabia's role in Syria and, and, and I am critical of both I am critical of both Saudi Arabia's role and Iran's role in Syria I'm critical of both the U.S. interventions and Russia's intervention in the region. So all of these are disclaimers to say, you know, while we are criticizing our own wars in the region, which, you know, all of us do, we should also keep in mind that it will give us more legitimacy in the region and in the U.S. if we had strong messaging against all interventions, if we asked even our government to use our leverage uh, with our friends and allies or with our foes to uh, institute a regional-wide uh, sales, um, uh, you know, arms embargo, or a regional-wide, um, you know, ceasefire, ideas that will include other, uh, other very destructive uh, uh, players in the region. Another protest at Yale Law School will take place Saturday, April 16th at noon. It takes place in the context of a UN report that says 10,000 children have died in Yemen because of the war and with confirmation that Yale Law School accepted $10 million from a Saudi billionaire whose company has extensive ties to the Saudi military. Two days later, on April 18th, in the afternoon at 4.30, there's a protest in Providence, Rhode Island at Textron. It's a maker of cluster bombs. The world headquarters of that company is on 40 Westminster Street, and that's where the protest will take place. It's sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. Cluster bombs are a particularly nasty weapon and most nations of the world refuse to use it. Obama sells it to the Saudis, and they use it in Yemen. Now, Elan Pape at Yale University. Pape taught at an Israeli university before the fascist undertow in that country made it too dangerous for him and now he teaches at Exeter in England. He's written many books, including The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. In the talk uh, tonight, I would like to uh, try and address from various angles the uh, statement I made in the title of the talk, which is a kind of a question, but also an answer. Is Palestine still the issue in 2016? 
you can either read it with an exclamation mark or with a question mark. But I hope that uh, we will spend some time here thinking about it together, pondering about this question. The academic work uh, on Palestine until uh, recent years uh, especially in the departments of history, politics, social sciences, uh, did not produce any new thinking about the question of Palestine. In fact, uh, if you looked for uh, new ideas of how to push forward peace, justice, and reconciliation in Palestine, you had to look elsewhere, not to the academia, but to the civil society. NGOs, groups of activists, pundits, committed persons were far more innovative and far more pioneering in their thinking than academics were about the issue of Palestine. It is in those uh, circles that uh, the depiction of Israel as an apartheid state was courageously put forward as an option. It is there that the idea that Israel should be treated like apartheid South Africa was first introduced, which led to the very successful and effective boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, the BDS movement. <clears throat> and it is there where people were talking for the first time in a very convincing and significant way of alternatives to the failed peace process. Academics were not very good in offering any alternative to what the politicians have offered as the way forward. But recently, the academia has succeeded, I think, coming back with some fresh paradigms and ideas, which uh, will feed activism, I think, in the future. So that's a very positive development when you think that academics are not stuck in ivory towers and have some relationship to the reality around them. And uh, by what I refer to here, and I think is one way of answering the question, as you would, I hope you will see the connection very soon, is one way of answering the question whether Palestine is still the issue in 2016. What I mean is that in recent years, academics who write about Palestine, who research Palestine and Israel, have used an old paradigm that was forgotten when it was first introduced uh, in the 1960s by some French sociologist. But they rehashed it, they repackaged it as an effective paradigm. And this is the settler colonialist paradigm. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, lost 10 days ago one of the most exciting academics who brought to the fore the settler colonialist paradigm in general, and the one that dealt with Palestine in particular, Patrick Wolf. Uh, but he really, in his short period on this earth, he succeeded in leaving us a very significant legacy. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, his last book came out while he was still alive and he could see the impact that book had on academics all over the world. Why is the settler colonialist paradigm so important? Why is it so important to talk about settler colonialism with regard to Palestine? In order to understand the significance of this paradigm, you have to think of the paradigm that is hegemonic the one that still prevails as the main academic, and not only academic, perspective on the conflict in Palestine. 
if you talk to mainstream media, if you talk to mainstream academia, if you talk to politicians, it doesn't matter where they are, Palestine is not analyzed as a settler colonialist reality. It is analyzed as a conflict between two national movements. It's a conflict between two national movements, and therefore the solution is a compromise between two national movements. Two national movements fighting for the same country, hence probably have the same right and attachment to that country. And since the uh, most important academic centers that deal with conflicts in general, and with Palestine in particular, are here in the United States, it's not surprising that this paradigm is informed by ideas that uh, emanate in the world of business and uh, fur trade. So, uh, in the words of the pre if, uh, one of the former American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, if you want to solve a conflict like the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you should <coughs> make everything which is visible divisible and forget about the invisible aspects of the conflict because they are indivisible. And if they are indivisible, if you cannot partition them, they are not conducive to peace. What she meant by indivisible, invisible aspects was issues such as justice, morality, <laughs> the right of the refugees to return. These were all invisible aspects. What is divisible? Land, water, security, sovereignty. These are the four elements. And it's not surprising that with the uh, despair of years of a struggle for liberation that did not produce liberation, quite a few Palestinians were willing to go along eventually with this paradigm. I don't think they ever believed in that paradigm. But they were willing to take this paradigm. And the academia was very uh, powerful, uh, or played a very powerful role in producing knowledge about this. Uh, uh, paradigm. Namely, the role of the academia is to tell the politicians we made, we did the research that proves scientifically that your ideological positions are correct. <laughs> in, previous day, in previous times, that's what priests did with their connection to God. They, they gave a message from God that ideology was okay. Now it's the role of professors <laughs> to tell politicians that they can, that they are scientifically sound. So, if you want to understand the importance and significance of settler colonialism, you have to understand that it challenges the paradigm of a national conflict in Palestine. Now, the United States of America is a very good place to talk about settler colonialism. <laughs> People probably know about settler colonialism in this country. But for those who don't know what settler colonialism is, it's very different from colonialism. These are people who left Europe because Europe was a place they could not live in anymore. They really had to leave Europe. These are not people dispatched by empires to colonize so that the empires would grow and extend. These were really people who were running for their life. Whether they were Jews, Huguenots, Puritans, or people living uh, in uh, Protestant areas of Germany during uh, uh, the religious wars. It doesn't matter. People had to look for a safe haven. So they were actually buying a one-way ticket. And they settled in someone else's homeland, where they thought not only to build a home, but also to make the home a homeland. With only one small problem, of course, that the homeland was inhabited by another people. 
And in many cases, as Patrick Wolf says so clearly in his brilliant work, in many ways, the encounter with the indigenous native people uh, led to what he called the logic of elimination. There was no way of creating a new homeland for Christian or Jewish refugees from Europe without demolishing, destroying, eliminating the indigenous people. And that's what made settler colonialism so different from colonialism. Colonialists went back home. Settler colonialists made the new place their home. I'll read to you the start of an article in the British paper The Guardian by Glenys Kinnock. The headline is, Syria's Daraya needs airdrops to save its people from starvation. The Syrian regime has isolated Daraya, a town of 8,000 people, for more than three years. The UN World Food Program has reported a desperate need for food and has evidence that people are reduced to eating grass. Daraya is suffering horribly, but its people continue to emerge from the basements where most now have to live, bravely taking to the streets to demand that the siege be lifted. No UN aid has reached Daraya for years. The Code Pink petition calling for airdrops of food to besieged areas in Syria is as important as ever. Before I go, I want to mention two interviews we put up on YouTube. One about an Assad-ISIS alliance to conquer Yarmouk camp. Another about a suicide attempt by a man who activists say was tempted into a phony terrorist plot by the authorities. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle. Thank you.